Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Management Consulting Industry Panel for Google VetNet Career Week. I'm Nathan Iglesias from the Strategy and Operation Team for Google's Operations Center and a proud member of the Army National Guard. For the next hour, I'm honored to talk to four wonderful panelists currently employed at consulting firms. The purpose of this panel, like the other industry panels we're hosting, is for you to hear from representatives of different companies talk about their experience as consultants, understand what type of work is involved, and hear recommendations on getting your foot in the door. We hope by listening to these stories, you'll have a better sense of what it means to be a management consultant to better inform your career aspirations. Kelly, Sophie, Katie, and Carrie, thanks so much for joining us today and for giving back to the veterans and military spouse communities. I'd love to start by going around the panel and having you introduce yourselves. Tell us who you work for, what role you have, and what branch of the military you were in. And also let us know what you love most about working at your company or as a consultant in general. So we'll go ahead and get started with Kelly. All right, Mike is on now. Um, hey everyone, I'm Kelly Swaintech. It's really nice to meet y'all. I am a partner at Bain & Company. Um, I uh, also helped found our Austin office and in addition to my casework, I am the head of Veterans at Bain globally and a part of our DEI operating council. Um, it's kind of crazy. I've been here for 10 years, which dates me. You can't see the white hairs coming out of my head, but I've been in consulting for 10 years now, and in a prior life, I was an Army engineer. What I love most about my company, uh, <laughs> I have to say, you, you'll you'll gather this as we talk, but I'm um, authentically myself and, and can't really help it, and Bain allows me to do, <laughs> to do that and be quite vulnerable, um, and so it, it has to be that I can bring, bring my full self the good and the bad to work. And, and that lets me have the biggest impact um, when it comes to actual client work, so. Great, thanks for sharing, Kelly. All right, Kelly, we're gonna move over to you for your introduction. Did you say Katie or Carrie? Sorry, <laughs> Carrie, I know we have a lot of C's and K's <laughs> sounds on us. This is <laughs> Carrie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for the clarity. So I'm Carrie Comley. I am a senior consultant at Deloitte. I am also a U.S. Army veteran and military spouse. So my husband still serves active duty in the Army today, um, which is why I'm so excited to get to be part of this panel as I get to give back to the, the community and stay connected with them. Um, really, my background, uh, most specifically, as I mentioned, I was a U.S. Army officer, but I went to global business school decided to get into global tech sales, and then found that I didn't have that fulfillment that I was looking for in that everyday impact uh, servicing clients. And so I made a pivot into management consulting. Um, at, at Deloitte, I specifically work on the GPS side, which is the government public services side. So the clients that I work with are particularly in the government or the public services. My particular role is more like product management. So I'm working with the development team specifically on the business requirements side to truly flesh out those various business requirements and functionality uh, needs to really solve their problems. And honestly, that is my absolute favorite part of my job and being at Deloitte is I've only actually been at Deloitte for a couple of months at this point, I would imagine three or four, and I already get to see the true impact uh, with the client and enhancing their everyday workflows and, and just ultimately saving them copious amounts of time and bringing value to them. So that is absolutely my favorite piece. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I'm also involved with the veteran community. And so I get to do that with the weight as well. So that's a little bit about me in a nutshell. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate that. All right, Katie, you are up next for the introduction. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Katie Neff and I was in the US Marine Corps. I work at Boston Consulting Group now, based out of Dubai. And I'm a little closer to the starting point, so hopefully I can give some good tips to those interested. I've only been working here for three and a half months because my start date was delayed due to COVID. So uh, really, really fresh into the job. I'm a consultant. And let's see, what do I love? Well, I think I relate a lot to the camaraderie from the Marine Corps. My project team is a team that I go through struggles with, and we also uh, have a lot of celebrations together when we get through uh, some grinds. And um, I also like that it's development focused. I think something I really enjoyed about 
the military is that we continue to grow and learn throughout our careers. And I find that at BCG, I'm doing the same thing. I have a week of training coming up um, already and very new to the job. So, so far, it's great. Good people, really interesting work, and I love living abroad. That does sound fun. All right, Katie, thank <laughs> you for that. Um, Sophie, up to you for an uh, introduction, please. Sure. Hi, my name is Sophie Hilaire. Nice to meet you all. Um, I am a manager at McKinsey. I've been here for almost four years, which is crazy. Um, I've been based out of our Philly office the entire time. And uh, I specialize mostly with public sector clients. That's kind of a common place where vets will find themselves. Um, I've also been really involved in vets recruiting every year. So I got here by way of business school. Um, I was in the army before for six years. And uh, most of the time as an ordinance officer, um, graduated from West Point in 09. And one of the things that I love about McKinsey more than anything is just how flexible and supportive they are of us having a really full life outside of work. So um, right now I live in my van. I've been doing this full time for a year. So I'm parked in front of, one of my good friend's house on Venice Beach in California today. It's my office. Um, and they've been really awesome about that. And uh, and even like a couple years ago, they let me disappear for a couple of months to go climb Everest. And we're really supportive about that as well. Um, I don't know how many jobs you can do post MBA or in any other realm where, where they're like very, very supportive of you disappearing for two months. So um, it's a pretty special place. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. I actually, thank, thank all of you. you. Thanks for opening up and sharing kind of a little bit about your backgrounds. To those that are listening in, I just want to say that these four individuals, very, very impressive backgrounds. As a moderator, it is humbling. And so I just wanna say that it, I'm really, really privileged to be here amongst you and I'm really looking forward to kind of delving in and as we press in and get some, gather some more value for our listeners. Okay, so first, um, this is gonna be for Kelly and Carrie. Carrie, um, I wanna just kind of explore a little bit about the journey uh, of what brought you into consulting. And, and specifically, a lot of people uh, know, they refer to like getting a break or some way of getting into the, the industry and into the business. Um, and, and all four of the firms that you represent are incredibly um, prestigious. They're like very, very big accomplishments. So my question for both of you, Kelly and Carrie, is what, did you experience a break or how? what was your, your path into uh, consulting? <laughs> I, I I can go first, Carrie, and then uh, you can hit <laughs> your story. But um, my break was I so I got out of the military. I went and got my MBA, and then I just I got to school and I went to like every recruiting event you could imagine, like all, all of the things. I just went. I was like I was going to be an investment banker. I didn't even know what they did. Um, I was <laughs> going to be a product manager. Didn't know what that was. Um, this word consultant, uh, and so. I was kind of looking at all of the things and that that's uh, an interesting approach that I wouldn't advise <laughs> looking back. But what I guess my, my break, if you will, was um, in, in all of the firms that I, um, that I started talking with was the veteran community. And, and this extends beyond just consulting is the veteran community is quite small and the desire to pay it forward is great. And for me, it was, uh, I had met, two different RB officers at two two different firms and they're like one was a, a buddy of mine from West Point and he knows me quite well and he said Kelly listen I think you'd actually like this <laughs> just give give it a shot I was um, late to applying to the interview I attended no events I talked to no one from my current company and uh, he he opened the door back up back up for me frankly and it's been I would say that when I went into consulting, I didn't have a plan of like, I would, if you asked me if I were 10 years later, I would say, I had no idea. I couldn't even, like, I still to this day can't explain to my mom what I do. Um, <laughs> so it's not that I had charted this very deliberate path of like what my life would be like military. I think the the best advice I could give y'all uh, is, you know, chart your next six months to two years of what you want to be with a long North star. My experience is there's a lot of twists and turns in the road that, that, uh, so thank you. 
Oh, I apologize if you can hear my dogs howling in the background. I'm not sure if you can hear that. I have two German Shepherds, so they like to really participate in my calls. Uh, interestingly enough, Kelly, I would say my story sounds a little more like yours as well. In the very beginning, I went to every type of networking event, career fairs. Um, I actually ran into how I got to the Google event was I ran into somebody at the Google Veterans Summit that I attended. Um, and that's how I'm here today. Um, actually, the break that I got into Deloitte was through a, another veteran who was in a similar uh, portion of his transition as well. So we actually met at an interview for a different company uh, that neither of us are currently working for. Uh, interestingly enough. So I would say networking is very important. And I think it's just as important to figure out what you don't want to do as well. So there were quite a few events I went to that I thought, okay, I thought this was something that I thought it was, but it's not. Um, and it was good to get that exposure because it's hard to figure out what you don't know as well. Um, I, as I mentioned, got, got into Deloitte uh, through a colleague and a, and a very good friend of mine who just happened to have an opening on, opening on his team. And uh, I, I sprung for the opportunity and it just made sense. So my big advice for people, um, as if I'm sure people will take a look at my LinkedIn and wonder, Carrie, you went from global tech sales to internal consulting and financial services and then ended up at Deloitte doing something completely different with a different client. I am one of those people who likes to plan everything and then finds out that I just take opportunities when they arise. And I love to have goals and, and aspirations, but if something works for me and it makes me excited and it makes me happy and it works for my family, I take it. Um, and honestly, this has been such a fulfilling, rewarding decision that I've made to come here. And I would advise everyone to just be comfortable in the uncomfortable and take opportunities as they come to you because you never know when you're gonna get them again. So that would be my advice for anybody who's looking to make that transition and feel like you have to make a chartered path it's okay to go off of the path and, and just do what makes you and your family happy. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Kelly, as well. I think that um, the concept of paying it forward and having a sense of community that we can rely on each other in the military is something that's uh, probably ubiquitous across a lot of industries. It's just part of our culture. So it's really nice to hear that. And for, again, all of, all of our listeners, no doubt these, these individuals here would be available. Um, if you did have questions and you wanted to reach out to them via LinkedIn. We can get into that later, though. Um, Carrie, what you kind of closed with is actually my next question. This is for Katie and Sophie. Um, as we kind of explore the concept of journey into one space, um, I'm curious for you, was it something that, that you planned in the military environment, were trained to, to you know, spend a lot of time planning to, to achieve our objectives? Or was it something that ended up being opportunity that presented itself in, in different directions. So again, the question is, did, did you take more of a planning approach to get into where you are now? Or is this something that if you looked back, you almost couldn't have, have predicted the way it and, and unfolded? And we'll start with Katie. Sure. Um, yeah. And I really appreciate, uh, Carrie, what you mentioned in terms of just taking opportunities as they come, um, which speaks to my path. I am a planner. And I think I have a trajectory. I know the things that are important to me. And some, I'm, some of those are like, I care about the environment. So how can I continue to have a, a piece of that in my life? Um, and that can take a lot of different shapes. So my, my path was not really planned. And um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but I went to Columbia Business School and Policy School. So I spent, uh, I actually spent three and a half years in school and I had three internships. <laughs> so I took, I took the approach of trying different things to see what I liked and did not like. Initially, I did not think that I wanted to go into consulting because I had such a passion for the military. I was trying to find that sense of purpose that I felt so strongly in the Marine Corps. How can I get that fixed again? Um, so I did an internship with the National Park Service, um, kind of a business internship. Um, and then I did more of a research internship at the business school and then ultimately said, you know, I should give this a try. I should take the risk of seeing what it's like to be on the private sector side and decide then. So then I, I focused in on recruiting for management consulting and found that I actually do like it. Um, where I'm going next, um, I think there are you know, I, I have some decision points, but nothing is set in stone. So it's it's kind of open-ended, but am I still 
happy with my life and the things that I'm doing. Thank you, Katie. Sophie? Yeah. So for me, as far as like the plan to get to consulting, that was so deliberate. But once I got into consulting, um, I've been pretty much taking a very opposite approach. So as far as even getting into this space, I feel like for me, it started when I was on deployment in Afghanistan, studying for the GMAT, having random calls with people in different industries about what my life was going to look like when I got out of the army. Um, and then once I went to business school, it was kind of, you know, consulting was my first choice for summer internships and opportunities. And so I actually interned at the same firm that I work at now full time. So in a way that is probably about as programmatic and deliberate as you can be. But um, and I was really excited about coming into consulting, coming from the army, because I knew I was leaving the military permanently to go into the civilian world, but I hadn't been a civilian in a while and I'd never had any experience in the business world. So to me, joining a firm as a generalist looked really appealing because I could learn a little bit about everything um, and see what I liked and what I was actually good at and all these things I never really got to, to experience when I was in the army. So um, yeah, once I got to the firm here, I have been doing what we call a random walk. So it's been everything from, you know, government projects to candy to steel to, I mean, really random industries, all different functions too. And I've actually really enjoyed that. Um, and even more recently in the last year, I've taken a one year rotation to actually go internal at McKinsey. Um, and this has kind of showed me more of like high level strategy of how this firm works. And at the same time, um, I'm not necessarily on the same schedule as I used to be for the first three years. Um, so it affords me to have a little bit more life outside of work here in my van. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily my my path as a generalist once I started, which has been very random, I think is pretty um, different than what most people do. I think especially most vets have a very deliberate approach about exactly what they want to specialize in, how many years to partner. Um, but I've been a little, a little, uh, a little different in that way, but really enjoyed the path I've taken. Thank you, Sophie. I think that um, there's four different journeys and paths that, that have brought you to where you are. And I think that's good for our audience to hear as a reminder that there isn't just one path and that it's okay also to not know what you want to do. Um, but I think that's something, another theme I heard is the interest in having impact and that that feeling of relevance and, and not just one, it's really beyond a paycheck, but you know, we are still accustomed to the military of getting to have uh, that feeling of having a greater impact. And, and that's also something that I've heard you talk about, which is nice. So first off, thank you all for sharing kind of your journeys. And now I'd like to go and delve into the to the um, area of, to, for our listeners, what journey, if, as a mentor coach, what would you recommend to someone who doesn't have necessarily the background or experience that, that might be more often more popular and common in the consulting space, but who wants to start going that direction? What are some of the things that they can start to do? And I'm going to go ahead and start with Carrie this time. Okay. So basically the question is, is what can they do to try to prepare themselves to get into this space? Yeah. So what's going to, for someone specifically who maybe isn't the, the most obvious candidate because the maybe they're an unconventional candidate, they've got a military background. And so they they don't see a lot of their peers in consulting. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that always take your value um, and, and sell it to whoever you're trying to, to get any type of role with, right? And I would say that that's a, that's a blanket statement for any role for any veteran that you're ever going to leave the military, maybe your military spouse, whatever it is you're doing, sell yourself and the value that you can bring to uh, your potential manager, the firm that you might want to get into, um, or just the role in general. Because more often than not, I think it's it's pretty safe to say that most organizations at this point are looking at things more holistically um, versus, you know, you have these particular certifications or these skill sets or these particular um, experiences that got you here. Um, I would say that it is likely common that if you can empathize with a client, for example, in consulting, if you have a particular background that lets you empathize with them in a way that you understand their business challenges, you know the types of things that they're doing in their everyday life, you might not need that functional experience to be able to provide value to your team that you're working with. Um, so I would say try not to let those particular certifications or requirements bog you down or not make you go for the opportunity uh, because you never know when something could arise 
and what they're actually looking for. Of course, you can look at job descriptions and you can see that. Uh, but I would say don't sell yourself short. Sell your value. Network with people who are in those roles because they will tell you exactly what somebody's looking for um, and the type of value that they need to bring to their team. And they'll help you set, your, set you up for success. So I think we've all mentioned many a times that there were veterans here um, that we've leaned on for mentorship and sponsorship to get into whatever organizations we're in um, or to learn what we didn't want to be in, et cetera. Lean on your veteran community and lean on other people that you have commonalities with because, you know, you might be selling yourself short and you don't even know the type of value that you could bring until you meet with those people. So network, 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 and sell the value of yourself. Thank you. Very solid advice, Carrie. All right, this next question is for both Kelly and Katie. Um, I want you to think through um, the different types of roles that exist in a management consulting firm. I think that oftentimes we probably might limit ourselves, and maybe this is accurate or inaccurate, but that there's really only one type of uh, role in a management consulting firm, and it might be easier and best and a better fit for some of our audience members to know that there are different types of roles and different ways to get in the organization. And then if there are things like internal mobility. Um, so go ahead, we'll get started with Kelly and then Katie, if you could also respond. Yeah, and, and Nathan, I, one thing that I wanna, I know I'm not supposed to answer the previous question, but I wanna do, I do think it's important to add one thing, which is I recognize this, this group is, you know, the, the background is coming from the military, but it's similar to what Carrie said, don't sell yourself short, but the, the reason why each one of these firms likely have a diversity and affinity group called Veterans at whatever the firm name is or Veterans at Bain is because we've looked at the data and we know that, and I can speak on behalf of Bain, we know that vets outpunch their weight at our firm as they rise as consultants and managers and partners and servant leaders in our firm, our, like my firm in particular, numerous of our office heads, the heads of the Americas are, are veterans. Our CFO is a veteran. And so while you may feel like you're a non-traditional background, um, you're, you're actually bringing, our, our firm is seeking veterans out because of the value you bring. And oh, by the way, it's not just because we think you have good leadership, don't sell yourself short there either. You have great leadership, but you also likely have the intellectual horsepower to crack really tough problems. And so the combination of those two things is like can't be substituted. So that, that would be the one thing that I do want to say, because um, I, I get it. I, I felt like the fat kid in dodgeball when I started in consulting. I still feel like an imposter and like wonder if Bain's going to fire me um, on a regular basis just because I'm a head case. And uh, but but don't don't sell yourself short. And then they, the other point, what, what are the types of roles? Uh, I actually think most like for for well, there's there's usually I, I think probably for all the firms. There's the consultant side, you know, there's consultant positions. I don't know. We have advanced analytics positions. We have program manager positions. And then we have the internal roles. Um, mo to be honest, we have a fair, most of our veterans coming into to Bain start on the consultant side with a fair amount of flexibility, similar to what Sophie was talking about. Veterans like, you know, and the rest of the folks at the firm move in and out of various positions. And the nice thing about consulting is it actually gives you a fair amount of flexibility to do that and, and then go right back to, <laughs> to consulting if you want to do it. So um, what types of roles you should consider at first is uh, whatever the, I, I would say the consultant roles, probably if you want to be on the consultant side um, and don't, you know, coming from the military, especially if you've been leading a bunch of people, don't probably don't expect to come in immediately as a as a manager. I couldn't manage myself out of box when I first started, but but you'll you'll get there quite quickly um, if if you stick with it. Yeah, um, just to hop on what you were saying, Kelly. Um, I'm currently finding my way out of boxes. Um, just. Uh, you know, one box at a time. Um, but uh, but basically, I I think um, the like the roles in general are. I mean, they're kind of standard. If you go to business school, um, it's consultant. But uh, from a BCG perspective, I know like there might be some more senior folks that have. Um, advanced degrees coming from the military or just advanced experience. And I think probably just all the firms do this, hire at more senior levels for some of those individuals and also for um, more junior um, 
individuals or um, those who don't have a master's degree. Um, the firm's higher at the associate level, which again, like you said, Kelly, it can be tough to come in as um, in a more junior role when most of us have a lot of leadership leadership experience. Um, but it's it's nice to be a part of a, a new team um, if you can swallow your pride a little bit. I'm 36 and I am, I think like at least five years older than everyone on my team. And the youngest person on my team is 22. And he teaches me many things. <laughs> so if you can, if you can handle that and just be there on the team and let yourself give yourself the time to grow, um, you know there are a variety of roles, but most of them I think are associate and consultant, whether they're specific or generalist. Thank you both. I I love both of your demonstrations of humility and also like interjecting elements of humor and just realism into it. I think that that's fantastic. That's so consistent with the military community. And uh, it's really refreshing just to have that, that, you know, we can kind of laugh loudest at ourselves. Uh, but then also, um, like you said, Kelly, then the, the, the data that backs up that sure we'll laugh at ourselves, but we'll also work exceptionally hard and, and beyond just the problem solving and excuse me, beyond the leadership side, there's the problem solving capacity and tenacity that's just imbued into all of us being in the military environment. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Sophie, this next one is directed at you. Um, you share the fact that you've been in consulting for 10 years and something that has already been touched on a little bit, but has to do with, I want to talk about kind of candidly about the minimum qualifications to, to join a firm, especially of this caliber. Um, all of you have MBAs. Um, and so the, the question that some of our audience members might be thinking is, do I need to have an MBA to come into consulting? And uh, if not, are there other things I can do to, to bolster myself to still achieve those, those things and be a consultant? My internet cut out, but I think you were talking to me because I heard 10 years in the, <laughs> um, the so I do a fair amount of recruiting um, at Bain. And what I can tell you is there, <laughs> Not everyone that joins the firm is has an MBA. Katie alluded to it. We have I have many uh, veterans that join the firm straight out of the military um, with yeah with zero masters. What I can tell you, you know, what we look for in candidates. I don't really care what your pedigree is or where you if or where you went to business school. What I care a lot about is. One, do you have, you know, Nathan, what you said, the problem solving capacity to do the job. We are solving very complex problems for very iconic companies. So do you have that intellectual horsepower? And then secondly, and more importantly, do you have the ability to humble yourself to be able to learn how to do a job and be hungry to grow? Because the job is you know, it's not just the first year that you're growing. Like we say, we promote to incompetence. Like the, the flag is always moving and you're always, always growing. And Katie alluded to training, like training happens every single year because the job just keeps evolving. And so I don't, um, you know, in terms of what you can do to prepare yourself, I, you know, I'm not looking for folks to like attend random like classes online. I would say talk, get your foot in the door by talking likely to the veteran community um, networking sometimes is a bad word. It doesn't have to feel like salesy, it's genuine relationships and conversations. It's usually the best networking and, and then prepare for the case interview. Like <laughs> that's the, yeah, like all stop prep for the case interview. It's hard. And there are, all the firms have tons of resources to help you prep. There's books out there. It's been a hot minute since I interviewed, so I don't even know what the good ones are anymore, but, but you, leverage the the community at the firm to to help you prepare for the interview and then and then crush the interview but but you don't have to try to get all these other qualifications um before before you approach the the company awesome thank you for that all right sophie over to you this question is going to be about culture culture matters a lot culture um eats strategy for breakfast as it as so commonly said. Um, the question for you is, um, what is your experience about cultural alignment and also maybe some cultural misalignment that, that you've experienced or that a veteran might experience when moving from the military space into the management consulting space? Yeah, I'd say our culture is one of, one of the things that really excited me when I was going through the recruiting process was just how clear it was to me that all the things that are like kind of weird about me 
people at McKinsey got pretty excited about. It wasn't like they were horrified or I needed to kind of like mute those aspects of myself. Um, and that's definitely rang true as I've been here. I mean, they've like internally, um, I've seen and even externally in different ways, how supportive they've been with just trying to share parts of my story with colleagues. It's more of like a, a point of inspiration instead of like um, a black sheep kind of thing. So that's been great. Um, but as far as like veteran culture and how that might clash with McKinsey culture, I've definitely experienced this. Um, and I think for me, it showed up the most at the beginning when I came in with my military mindset of like, things go top down. You can get creative to an extent. You got to be flexible, but like nobody wants you to completely rewrite the plan and make it your own. Um, whereas at McKinsey, it's really different. We have something called the obligation to dissent. So um, anyone in the team room has the obligation to speak up if they don't agree with something. Now, if that were like a private in an army um, unit or something speaking up and had something to say to the commander, um, and it was a point that wasn't necessarily about like something being um, an unlawful order, but just like a better suggestion that just wouldn't fly. It's literally the opposite at McKinsey. If you don't raise your hand, um, you're you're wrong. And I've I saw this even in my summer internship where the um, the business analyst, which is I guess the lowest ranking member of a McKinsey team, but probably the smartest, um, they would constantly push back on the partner in these meetings, and the partner loved it. They would always respond with good push, and it was like genuine, not like facetious. And uh, so that flip in like how I needed to think of of myself on the team is like um, just as critical in generating ideas for how we're gonna get to the best solution as a team by the end of it um, was something that took me honestly several months and maybe a few different team leaders of telling me the exact same thing until I finally overcame my my fear of just looking stupid and sharing an, an, an opinion that maybe wouldn't make it into the final answer. But that's kind of the whole point. Like everyone should be talking as much as possible because with, so much iteration, way more iteration than I ever experienced in the army. We get to such a different level of an answer by the end of a, of, of a project. So for me, that was a big cultural shift I had to make in my own head. Um, other bets, I think, figure it out a lot faster, but it was probably pretty universal. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Sophie, for sharing that. I like that, the obligation to dissent. That's something that I'm going to incorporate in my team. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, I think that in a place like Google, and I'm sure a lot of our audience would agree, sometimes we don't necessarily feel as comfortable um, dissenting. We don't view it as an obligation, but I think by viewing it as an obligation, um, then it kind of makes you feel like you have approval to do that. So that's that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, oh. Since this is an important question about culture, I do want to pause and open it up to if anyone else on the team has anything that they, they felt was particularly germane or, or important to share. Just doubling what Sophie said, and vets usually struggle with it. It's like one of the biggest struggles I see with vets is they sit around the table. You know, we've been taught to keep our mouths closed unless we have something very impactful to say. And it's being comfortable and not worrying about asking the stupid question or saying the stupid thing. Because the more I ask the, ask the dumb questions, I realize everyone else in the room was like, oh, yeah, I was thinking that too. And I just didn't say it. And, I can tell you my my team now that I'm I'm more senior at the firm, um, they have no issue pushing back on things that I say and get great joy out of out of uh, out of it. So, it, but that's the biggest change. That's one of the biggest changes from the military. Okay, Katie, you look like you might want to add, but you're you hesitating. Yeah, I'm just like trying to structure what I want to say here because I. I kind of like, I definitely relate with exactly what you said, Sophie and Kelly. Like I, I, um, I guess I, maybe I, I don't feel like in the Marine Corps, I wasn't allowed to say things, but you know, like, I think the, the idea of, you know, like you only bring things up if it, if it's relevant and is kind of like a big red flag and in work, in consulting, it's kind of like things are open for discussion. You know, oh, what about this or what about that? And, you know, I think I'm still realizing that it's okay to bring up thoughts that might completely change 
the whole direction of a work stream, um, but for the better. Okay, great. Um, so that's that's an adjustment. And I think in terms of culture, um, for me personally, I think switching from the military to the civilian world was just an adjustment in um, how I present myself and what and understanding what expectations are. Um, not, I mean, it's just different. And for me, the, it was, it's been a, an adjustment. And I think maybe this goes back to like what to do maybe before entering consulting or kind of just evolving from the military life is I think school, no matter what type of school, is a nice environment to understand options and then also uh, figure out, it, it allowed me time to figure out myself before I entered the, the professional world uh, and committed to something. So I just kind of wanted to lob that in there as a little piece of advice. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so beyond culture, which is obviously incredibly important, um, one of the things that both the military and management consulting are notorious for is long hours and time away from home. And I'm curious, um, is this something that has rung true for you? Has it been similar um, across the world? I mean, when you think about um, the time you put in and you think about also the time you have to sacrifice from being home or being with loved ones, um, how does it? How do the two worlds feel similar or different? Because I know a lot of our people uh, who are watching this are probably wondering or thinking uh, that it's too many hours or that at least that's what they might've heard. And for that question, <laughs> sorry, um, we're actually going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Carrie on that. And then Sophie, if you could hit on that one as well. So this question actually excites me uh, because when I was leaving business school, consulting was one of the things I was trying to avoid because of what you just said. I spent a lot of time trying to balance my, my dual military career with my husband and even if he wasn't in the field, I was off and, and somebody was gone. It just never worked out. And so I thought I, I would love to be a consultant, but that lifestyle seems daunting. And I love to travel. Uh, it's just for my personal leisure. And so I was afraid to make that my job because I thought I would hate it if I was working all the time. So um, I love this question because the particular client that I have in government public services and the timing that I have come into consulting, you know, we're, we're, we're post COVID or during COVID, a lot of people are not going to client sites um, right now at this point. And in the government public services, a lot of your clients are still in the DC, Maryland area. So I can still come home. Uh, if I have to go to the client site, I can come home the same day. I can still stay in my home. I still see my husband. Um, I don't have any issues with uh, managing my time in a, in a way that feels uncomfortable or that I don't have the ability to have hobbies or, or things I want to focus on outside of my work. Um, and honestly, that was surprising for me because I thought that it was going to be me putting in 15 hours a day and work never ended, especially in a remote environment. Um, personally, because of the type of project that I'm on, a lot of the development, development team that I work with, they're not even co-located with me. Um, so we've we would typically still be pretty remote even after that, unless it needed to be on client side, of course. So it's just client driven. And I would say that that goes back to understanding who you might want to speak with and and understanding, you know, different firms and different roles, wh who the client might be, what you're actually going to be offering. Because, you know, if you were to ask all four of us this question, we're probably all going to have a completely different answer or maybe in different parts of our career where you might be putting in more time in the beginning, but maybe it's not as much. I know how Sophie had mentioned that her schedule looks a lot different right now than what it did before. Um, so, you know, understand that consulting ebbs and flows as well. Very comparable to the military, where maybe you're on a deployment, but you come back and you're kind of hanging out for a little bit, right? Um, and it's a little bit slower. So I would say consulting can be pretty similar as well. But uh, that all wrapped up, I would say it is very possible to manage your life uh, in a way that you can have that work-life integration in a way that works for you and your family. Thank you, Carrie. Sophie? Yeah, happy to pile onto that. Um, so when I was originally doing my calculus for what job I would want to do after my MBA, um, the fact that consulting had long hours seemed like a fine trade-off when I compared it to like 
disappearing for a year on deployment or something like just being gone Monday through Thursday didn't seem so bad. You're always going to be home on the weekends um, and not have to work on the weekends, probably. So and at the time, I was also really excited about traveling and flying around all the time. And um, that that honestly just felt like a thrilling kind of energy to, to get pulled towards. Um, at the same time, this my whole time at this company, I've been unmarried, no kids. And I think that's made it really easy for me. Um, my hours are really different due to COVID. The About the first five months of the pandemic, I was not internal. So I was kind of doing from my van um, the classic McKinsey work, which was which was a lot. Um, but uh, on a, I feel like we've kind of worked out a lot of the kinks on that now that, now that it's been so long and folks are kind of starting to return uh, to travel. Um, before when I, you know, was doing my classic McKinsey role of, of uh, being a consultant. I couldn't even make dinner plans with a friends on a Tuesday. I mean, maybe I was having dinner in another city, but like, I didn't necessarily have like a community. I always felt like throughout the whole week. Um, and that's something that's important to me. So I feel like now at like this four year point, I'm, I'm more about charting my own course and, and just choosing what part uh, or what job could work based on the lifestyle. That's really kind of where my starting point is. Um, for me at this point, I would probably only do remote work going forwards. Um, at our firm, we're kind of looking at a, a few different models for how things are going to be going forward. Like the classic Monday through Thursday schedule that we all used to be on. I don't, I mean, will be one possibility going forward for I'm sure certain teams um, and certain folks who are really drawn to that model, but um, there will be a lot more flexible options like like what I'm doing right now or something in between so you're not traveling so many days a week. Um, so by the time anyone who's watching this is coming into one of these roles, um, you know, my experience is not uh, the, the only the only model that, that they'll have to choose from. So I think that's really good. Um, before there was only really one thing to pick from. And now like you can, you, there's a lot of, a lot of ways to make it fit whatever your lifestyle and family needs. Thank you, Sophie. A um, couple quick uh, follow-up questions for you. Uh, first one, can you explain to us the difference between, you said you're internal with McKinsey versus uh, external. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I would say, sorry, when I say external, I mean like normal consultant, externally facing, um, dealing with clients and uh, probably traveling um, in a normal scenario. I took a one year internal rotation. This might be something that is is uh, available at the other firms, too. Um, but essentially, it's kind of like taking a knee, if you will. Um, and you can kind of pick from different roles about um that are just internal to McKinsey. So McKinsey is its own firm, its own entity, serves all these different clients and companies, but we as a company need to exist somehow. And who's running that? Well, there's mostly a team of folks who are always dedicated to specifically to that, but they also rotate in consultants to kind of bring in the perspective of the folks who are actually going off and doing the work, and linking that in with the folks who are coming up with a strategy for how the firm moves um, over time. So, um, yeah, for the last year or for this year, I've been working on experience for our colleagues and clients, and uh, I'm chief of staff to a senior partner who's who's been leading that. So um, after this, I can go back to classic consulting um, or I could permanently stay in an internal role or uh, maybe move on to the next thing. So more options coming soon. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. Um, this next question is going to be directed at Kelly and Katie. Um, it has to actually do with the fact that something I've heard consistently is that there's different options that you can choose for your path. You can go this way or go back to being a conventional consultant. There's internal, there's external. My question for you, Kelly and Katie, um, is in the military, we're accustomed to having very um, clear and plotted paths. For how we promote and essentially you want to do your 20 years this is where you can essentially see yourself or expect to be in 20 years time my question for you is is that similar within the consulting world is did you have guidance or is it more or less you have to choose your own adventure and um and you're you're first and primarily responsible for your career and progression kelly you're mm -hmm. muted Man, I keep muting myself because I'm worried that my like two and a half year old is going to run in here like a <laughs> Um 
so I'll compare myself to, to my husband who, who also got out of the military and he does a cool job now, but very different in terms of knowing his path. So like versus, um, in consulting, it is actually, if you're, if you're staying in the traditional consultant role, it's pretty dang clear. Um, I'm less familiar with Deloitte, but I can talk for like McKinsey, BCG and Bain. It's like, you generally know if you're in the consulting role around what time you should be getting promoted to, we all call it different things, but you know, manager and partner and beyond. Um, but what I will say, so that's similar to the military and something that I think as a, I was very comfortable to know that like, that's my North star. Um, but I caveat that with it, it's very much so a meritocracy to get to those, to get to those points, but there's actually a lot of flexibility within those points. So, you know, I won't talk about the internal versus external because Sophie hit on it, but, you know, just even in the types of work you do for my, you know, first three years at, at Bain, I did a ton of private equity and hedge fund work. And that was mostly born out of the fact that I felt again, like the fact can in dodgeball and I want to get exposure to as many industries as possible. And like private equity deals, it's basically every, you know, three to four weeks you're doing a different deal. But I did that for three years, not expecting to do that for three years. And then, you know, I realized I wanted to be in consulting longer term or not realized, but, you know, thought about what I want to be when I grow up. And it was around the time that I was a probably at the three-year mark as a manager. And at that point, I talked to a handful of my sponsors and mentors. And I said, my whole identity at Bain is this private equity hedge fund person. But I, you know, I don't want to do that for the next 15 years of my life. Like that was never <laughs> who I thought I was. Help me, help me think through what might be a bit a good option for me. And um, some, you know, one one of my sponsors who knows me quite well directed me to energy and natural resources, which I was like, I like barely know how the lights turn on or the gas flows. Um, but that's an interesting thought, and you know, and it's something I would have never considered. But Neil was much more thoughtful than I was. He was like, Kelly, the one the folks at Bain that work in that that industry, I think you'll really like working with. And you know, by the way, you're a former Army engineer. You will you know, differentially be successful with the clients. And, you know, there's a certain nature to, you know, keeping the lights on and gas flowing. And so, you know, I, I say that because I, I, you know, now I'm here, I am like six years later, or seven years later from that point, still working in energy and natural resources. And I can tell you, I would have never worked in like, ener <laughs> like if I had charted my path like 10 years ago, actually, I probably wouldn't have worked in private equity or uh, energy and natural resources. And like, the other thing that I'll talk about is just like flexibility too, or in like location I've lived in, I started in Dallas, then lived in San Francisco, then lived in Amsterdam, then lived back in San Francisco and then Austin, all just for my own personal, <laughs> personal desires to move a lot. And so there's, you know, the, the chart is clear for promotions, but there's a lot of flexibility in the path of, of how you get there is what I would say. Thank yeah. you, Katie. Yeah, um, I think that was a really nice roundup, Kelly. I don't, I don't know that I have too much more to add, um, especially that I'm, I'm at the beginning of this path. What I can say is that, from my view, um, at the start, I see that I see a clear direction of, okay, this, these are the steps, and these are the promotion steps, and I. I think there's a balance between owning your own path um, and also there's a lot of support. Um, I think just like the other firms, we have a um, we have a system of getting feedback and understanding how we're performing and um, and also understanding a lot a lot of the different variety of options um, taking a, a secondment to go work at a, a firm that we have advised or taking a leave of absence to go like you know maybe i want to be like sophie and climb everest you know at some point <laughs> or get a van <laughs> um, <laughs> or something there are a lot of options that that allow um each of us to make it our own career, even though I think the broad framework is is quite quite clear. Um, so I like it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Um, this next question is going to be for everyone. Uh, we're going to go around. We'll start with Carrie, just to give you a heads up. 
Um, and I want to give you an opportunity to brag and showcase a bit about the things your firm does for veterans specifically. And before we get started, Carrie, while you're thinking it through, for example, at Google, ho hosting events like this, having vet uh, week, um, having organizations, um, employee uh, support groups, essentially, that allow the community at Google to come together and rally around veterans and veteran causes. Um, so um, think through some of the things that, that you are really proud of um, and that you want to be able to share kind of as a, as a measure of bragging about, well, this is what our, our firm does because we really value vets. So Carrie, you are up. Yeah, absolutely. I love I love this question. Um, two of my favorite programs or services that we have for the veteran and military spouse community. Um, I'll highlight one of each. So one of them is the Deloitte Core program. So as you're transitioning out of the military, you can actually um, apply to be part of the Deloitte Core program. And essentially what that is, is a gathering of veterans or military uh, transition members who are currently transitioning, of course, to really identify and figure out what it is they as Kelly mentioned, what they want to be when they grow up, right? Um, so not just trying to figure out, you know, how do I get into consulting, but just where do you need to go based off of what you care about, what you want to do, and how you can bring value to an organization or just in general in a role as you transition out of the military. So love that program. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, I can give information on it if you find me on LinkedIn. Um, another program that I really like is the Military Spouse Initiative, which is one that I actually learned about coming into Deloitte which made me very excited. Um, it's essentially a, a large group of all the military spouses who exist within Deloitte. Um, it's a support group, just as you would similarly have in your family readiness groups. Um, but this is very unique in a sense that you can reach out to these people and they understand everything that you're going through. They might be living in different parts of the world, international or national, and they can help you because they understand that military lifestyle. Um, something that I think is truly unique about it that differentiates it is that there's an ambassador or sponsorship program. So you can have a, a, a practitioner or a PPMD actually sponsor you and help you relocate in the event that your active duty member is uh, going to PCS. So there's a lot of different Deloitte offices. Um, and essentially what Deloitte wants to help military spouses do is stay with the firm. Uh, so they, they help you figure out how you can continue your career um, get on projects or different um, different areas with it, maybe enabling areas uh, within internal to Deloitte so that you can still keep your career and thrive and stay part of the Deloitte community. So I would say those are two of my very favorite uh, programs or services that we have with Deloitte. Thanks, Gary. I really like hearing about that, that support and flexibility for service members and families. All right, Katie, uh, we're going to go over to you next. Oh, man, this is actually a tough question for me. Um, so. I got into the BCG community through the Veterans Club and regular recruiting. However, I recruited to Dubai um, and the Middle East office is not connected to the US office. So I honestly, I leveraged the military community to get into consulting, but I there's not a, a formal group out here. Um, it's informal. Uh, so I, I just kind of want to start with that. Um, I will, however, the um, one of the guys I am the closest friends with here, uh, him and his wife, he was in the Navy, and we both interned together in the summer of 2019 and are now both full time out here in the Middle East. Um, but the U.S. military out here is just not quite as big of a deal. Um, in the U.S., we do have veterans events uh, for business schools and the like. Um, but I, I guess I owe you a follow-up, Nathan, because um, because of kind of a, just like a different route, I didn't really leverage the community quite as directly. Um, but there's still a good network because that's how I, how I got here. Yeah. Yeah, and no doubt be beyond just getting into the the firm, which is an achievement in and of itself, but then having that sense of community internally is probably something that it's a sense of familiarity um, and someone that you can share um, and reflect, you know, new experiences, w still having that lens of, of your military past. So that, that's good to hear. Kelly, yep. over to you. I'm not muted at this time. Um, so what I'm most proud of, um, I mean, <laughs> it's a very self-serving answer, but uh, it would be veterans at Bain. And the best way that I can describe it is, you know, we 
our organization, we have three goals and it's one to recruit the best veteran talent. The second is to develop folks when they get in the door. It is, it's, it's a harder transition than you think, right? You're humbling yourself and not knowing how to do things after, you know, probably being the best at your job. And then the third is retaining vets. And I'll, I'll provide a little bit more color on each one of those three things to help bring them to life. But recruiting, it's, you it's, um, you know, there are formal events, you know, experience being vets that where we hold like a one to two day full day event for folks transitioning out of the military to come join us, talk to our people, start getting case prep, but really start becoming part of our community. Um, there's the base program. I just interviewed all day yesterday, which are like our um, uh, black and Latin X vets, um, which is all focused. That's actually a, like before they ever go to business school coming in and spending a week with us and, um, you know, and I spend a, you know, before they ever start full time, I've had a two year relationship with folks. Um, and then I talked about it, you know, informally, or actually it's pretty dang formal, but our, our veteran consultants helping with the case prep and <laughs> helping people get ready for, for the actual interview. Um, it's, I, I'm always so humbled by how our folks who are busy in the job and have their own families, but how they are just like, eager to, to support vets as they, as they prep. Um, on the development side, what we do there, it's pretty deliberate staffing with, you know, I work with um, the staffing manager, the case manager, the case partner, as all of our vets get staffed, especially for the first year to be pretty deliberate about what that path looks like to make sure that they're getting a really well-rounded toolkit so that they can be successful. Um, it's, you know, formal mentors and sponsors. We have like a battle buddy program, which is at the consultant level. That's the person where you can like ask all of your dumb questions and not feel like you're, you're bothering someone. And then, you know, at the more senior level to start actually sponsoring and advocating for you. And then on the, on the retaining top veteran talent, that's, that's more of our connectivity event, events, which is like, you know, annually we have a massive global summit where we fly all the vets around the globe to a, to a location and spend a couple days together, you know, a mixture of, you know, um, fun, fun events, as well as talking about our strategy and where we're headed. And then there's the informal, which is up to each office where, where, you know, they have budgets and they have to tell me what their plan is, but you know, San Francisco, which I'm no longer part of, but I'm still in the WhatsApp group. They, they just sent a picture this past weekend and they got the whole crew together with like, I don't know, they were all like babies when I met them, but now they all have their own babies. So that's confusing, but <laughs> that's, the, that's the stuff that's, um, that I'm most proud of because I think, you know, I, I think the veteran community is, we're, we're a unique breed and um, making sure that we still have that connection to who we are from our prior life and don't lose that, I think is really important. Um, so yes, that would be my answer. The, the vets at Bain community. Thanks Kelly. That was um, that you demonstrated that there's both an informal and formal uh, network that is just in the, the fabric of the firm, which is, that's really, really encouraging to hear. And that sounds really exciting. And I bet that trip where they go around the world, what have you, that's probably <laughs> like a really, really fun thing to do. So that's awesome. All right, Sophie, you are up. I want to go on that Bain trip around the world. <laughs> um, so at McKinsey, I feel like we have definitely a pretty deep connection to our veterans. So our founder, James O. McKenzie, was actually a World War I Army vet. And uh, we've got a similar group here called Veterans at McKinsey, fill in the blank, <laughs> the consulting firm. That's our affinity network. Um, so they do a lot of social gatherings and like staffing opportunities and things that come through that. Um, they even do some new hire training. Training. So when new joiners come to the firm and they're kind of struggling to translate their military experiences into consulting, they'll like walk them through how to do that. Um, but probably the thing that I remember most from when I first joined that they helped me out with was getting paired up with a veteran of a similar military background um, for my first project that I was on. So I actually ended up on my first project. My team leader, if you will, was um, one of my friends who had also gone to West Point, also gone to Wharton. Um, and kind of, of course, like knew how I would think as a veteran coming to um, McKinsey at first. And so it was really helpful to just be on a project with him that was actually a government project. So um, I didn't have to learn how to be a consultant, what the heck this industry was, um, and like how to deal with my team leader. 
um, all at once. It was like the team leader was already my friend. Like the industry is something I'm familiar with, but I do need to learn how to be a consultant. But like in that context, it was much easier than like if I'd just been dropped into some tech thing day one. Um, so that was great. And then we also do a biannual veterans conference. Ours is in Philly every other year because we like to coincide with the Army Navy football game. So it really ends up feeling like a big reunion. And um, for us, um, every time that it's happened for me, it's I've like ran into friends who are vets that I didn't even know had come to McKinsey. And um, it just ends up being like a, a big, a big party. So, um, yeah. And then finally, our recruiting season is is again just kind of feels like a big party but um a lot of the vets get super invested and um involved with that and it's just a really fun way to kind of like pay it back and kind of remember what it was like being on the other side and um get to meet all the the new folks who are excited about coming to work here so it's a pretty active group thank you sophie um thank thank you all for um for the insights for the passion for the humor for the honesty um, and also for sharing, you know, intimately about your own journeys and some of the humility and self-doubt that you faced. And that's just something that we that we all have to face. And so I think by verbalizing it, you make it more acceptable. And considering the things that all of you have accomplished, you, are, again, are a very impressive, very accomplished uh, group. And I am very humbled and honored to get to, to help facilitate this uh, for the community. Um, we are at time, but I want to pause and and at least open it up if there's any final thing that you'd like to say um, that maybe it wasn't a question that was asked, but that you think is truly critical to be shared. I do want to give that space. Um, so let me go ahead and give a quick pause. It looks like we're good. I'm assuming that you're charging me over time because we are over the hour and I don't think that it is in our budget to pay for that. So again, I let me just say that um, thank you so much. Um, for, for your support of our Vet Week. Um, we found your stories to be incredibly fascinating and insightful. The audience and I certainly appreciate you. And we appreciate you giving back to those in the military community interested in consulting. And to those that are watching, this is the last industry panel and session for the day. We encourage you to log into this live stream tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern time for a series of inspiring executive fireside, fireside chats that will include the Alphabet Google CFO, the CMO of America's region at Google, Google's Chief Diversity Officer and the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. There's also a key to successful entrepreneurship panel with a few successful entrepreneurs that anyone thinking about starting a business should tune in for. And until then, thanks for tuning in and thanks for watching. Thanks all. <laughs>